and, and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with, the, with purpose of heart, they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed from Tarsus to seek, for Tarsus rather, to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians. Everybody say Christians. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Uh, this is, this is a, 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 a foundation for us. As we talk about purpose, one of the things that we struggle with in ministry, one of the things we struggle with as ministry leaders is defining the mission of our church, defining the vision for our church. What is it that God is calling us to do and how are we supposed to do it? I want to submit this simple idea to you that the mission of the church is the same mission that was outlined in Scripture. It never changes. One of the things that's complicated about church is that we have become very, very corporate-minded. Instead of ministry meetings, we have leadership meetings. And in having leadership meetings, we're often focused on a corporate structure and how things are supposed to do this and how things are supposed to do that. What I'm discovering now as I was reading through, uh, not even Acts this week, I was preparing for another sermon altogether, and God let me hear as I was reading through 1 Peter, actually, in chapter 2, as I was reading through 1 Peter, God, God outlined something for me that was, that was necessary for me as we rediscover mission in 2018. Uh, God made it very plain that mission never changes. Mission never changes. It doesn't matter how you articulate it. It doesn't matter what the words are that you use. The mission of the church never changes. In fact, the mission of the church is threefold. I'm going to make this very clear so you understand it. The church's mission is to exalt the Lord, evangelize the word, edify believers. Three things. Easy to understand. Number one, it is to exalt the Lord, evangelize the word, edify believers. Essentially, what our mission is as a church is to create a, a spiritual community within our body. That's, that's why we exist. That one, we are to create a spiritual community within the body. The church is a place where Christians can grow. We're number one, creating a spiritual community. Number two, we're evangelizing the world. Your first responsibility, however, is to create spiritual community. You're called into the body first. He doesn't send you out before he gives you a place to grow. There's an order here. So number one, you are called to create spiritual community. Number two, you're called to evangelize the world. Number three, you are called to magnify and exalt the almighty name of the Lord. Amen. That's why we come together and worship. We don't come together and worship because it's routine. We don't come together on Sabbath morning because it's just what we came to do. We don't come together on Sabbath morning so we can show off what we got on or so we can talk about what we went through this week. We show up on Sabbath morning because God is in his house and we come to declare the glory and majesty and marvelous name of Jesus Christ. The reason that you come to church on Sabbath is not so you can get your worship on, so you can get your praise on, so you can hear your song or have more order of service. The reason you come to God's house is to worship God himself. Amen. The challenge with church is that we are, we are selfish by nature. And so we often like church to fit into my box. This is what makes me comfortable. This is what I like. And church was never supposed to center around the people. It was supposed to center around the Savior. Amen. That's it. We still here? Church does not revolve around us. Church revolves around Jesus. And when we lose focus of Jesus, the church often loses focus in their mission and they fall off track. When church becomes what I need to do, how we want to function, how we want to do ministry, how we want to, how we want to meet the world, how I want 
to worship God rather than coming together and spending time saying, Holy Spirit, fill this place, empty me of selfishness, and then make me receptive to your voice, then I would hear what you desire for your church. That's what church is. And so the mission is to, number one, create spiritual community. Which is why we're wonderful at coming together, which is why we, we, we have all of our functions and we gather together. This was a part of the early Christian church. You are not wasting your time when you come together in fellowship. Let me make sure you understand this. You cannot fully experience, and I'm going to say this, I dare you to argue with me. You can argue with me after service if you want to, but I'm stubborn today and I don't think I'm wrong. You cannot experience full Christianity. You cannot experience the fullness of a walk with God if you're watching TV at home doing it by yourself. You can't consider yourself a part of the body of Christ without associating with the body. And somehow we created a community in, in 2018, 2017, 2016, social media and television ministry. Somehow we created a community where amputee Christianity was acceptable. Mm. Where we could be cut off from the body and still think that we're alive. You recognize that once something is severed from the body, it dies. You recognize that. Somehow we got into the comfort zone of saying, I don't want to be around those hypocrites. <laughs> so you want to be around yourself, you hypocrite? Right. <laughs> right. I don't want to be around all those hypocrites. They talk about Jesus, they sing their songs, and then they look at me funny. Well, this is a spiritual community where we are all called to grow. Amen. And so you're supposed to grow with us. There are certain parts about my body I don't like, but I'm not going to cut it off. <laughs> right. I'm going to tell you that right now. Right. I might have to try and get it tightened right again, but I ain't about to cut it off. Recognize that we are called to, number one, create spiritual community. Number two, we're called to evangelize the world. And the reason that, that this is secondary to creating spiritual community is because evangelism, whatever method you use in evangelism, is useless without people that are in tune and connected with the power of God. Amen. So when we talk about methodology and evangelism, when we talk about what are we going to do, how are we going to reach, how are we going to do this, it does not matter what method you use if you're not connected with Jesus. That's it, man. It does not matter how good your method is if you're not connected with Jesus. And watch this. If you are connected with Jesus, it doesn't matter how bad your method is. Because God can use the worst idea for his glory. Amen. Let me make sure you understand this. I wrote this down in my notes, so let me make sure that I read this to you properly. Poor people with great tools produce nothing. Poor people. I'm not talking about fiscally. I'm talking about poor in spirit. Poor people with great tools produce nothing. Poor tools in the hands of great people can do anything. Amen. Uh, so, so let me make, make this very practical. I, I studied theology. I don't know anything about carpentry. So if you put the tools of a carpenter in my hands, I will not be able to build a house. I can cut something. I can nail something. It will not keep you warm in the winter. <laughs> it will not keep you cool in the summer. It will not stand the test of time. Right. And if you lean on it wrong, it will go down. <laughs> because wonderful tools in the hand of someone who is untrained and unconnected produce nothing. Right. Now, now, now listen, let me make sure you understand the practical nature of this, because then when we start talking about what kinds of methods, what kinds of methods, what kinds of methods, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, when you're in tune with God, God will reveal to you what it is that he wants you to do and how he wants you to do it, and you will be able to naturally, with the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to naturally accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. So that's like me going into some of your kitchens, ladies and gentlemen who have the gift, 
Because everybody ain't got it. It's like you going into some of your kitchens and trying to tell you how to cook your favorite dish. You don't need new methods from me. You've done this long enough. You know what you're doing. You've been trained to do it. You don't need a new idea on how to make mac and cheese. And if any of you want to experiment, well, don't experiment with my batch, but you can experiment. Experiment all you want. Just give me the try and true method. Didn't I just say I was trying to get tight right? <laughs> Over here talking about volunteering to taste your mac and cheese. But, oh, taste and see that the Lord ah. is just <laughs> I want you to understand this. This is practical, okay? As we develop our, our mission, as we continue to strive for the kingdom of God, and we recognize, looking around at our world, we watch the news, we see Jesus is soon to come. As we see these things happening, we are those people that are called to a life of prayer, and prayer will prepare us to serve God, which is why I say this is strategic. You have to be a part of spiritual community first, to be trained so that you can grow, so that you can thrive, and then you can evangelize the world. Right? right. Because if I send some of the wrong people to go and share the right message, I was sitting in, I was sitting in a class with, with Dr. Bird, uh, Carlton Bird, and he was he was sharing some things with us, and. He said, a bad witness is worse than no witness at all. He said, a bad witness is worse than none. The right training, the right experience, the right connection, which is why you're a part of the body, the right connection prepares us to do the evangelism in the world. And then as we evangelize the world, we come into Sabbath morning worship so that we can celebrate what God has done with us all week long. Y'all get it? Yeah. You're a part of spiritual community. That's where you grow. That's where you thrive. That's where you're nurtured. And then you go out and do the work that God has called you to do. And he's calling you to do it individually. And, and he's calling us to do it as a church. And then after we've experienced God and after we let him have his way all week long, we come into his house on Sabbath morning and we shout to the glory of his name. That's the purpose, the mission, the vision that God gives us as a church. And we'll unfold more of that as the weeks come on. But I want you to spend time with me in Acts chapter 11. Because this is the foundation for where we begin. Acts chapter 11 and, and verse 26 tells us, And they were first called Christians. Everybody say Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Something happens in Acts chapter 11. They are transformed. There is a new, a new job title given to them. They move from being disciples, followers of Jesus, to being Christians, those who reflect and walk and share and show Jesus. All of them were called disciples before. Now they are literally called by his name. They're not simply disciples in Acts. By the end of Acts, there is a transformation that happens, and they are Christians in Acts chapter 11. It's a wonderful passage because we are Christians, right? At Seventh-day Adventist, we are Christians, right? Right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. And, and so, man, we are Christians. And so we were first called Christians in Acts chapter 11. And verse 26, you were first identified as a Christian in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And verse 19, now I want you to go back. Verse 19, the Bible says, now those who are scattered, remember now after the crucifixion and resurrection, after the work has already taken place, after, after Jesus has died for our sins and been resurrected, there is, there is that dispersion. There's the diaspora there for the Christian community. And now the disciples of Jesus are spread all over. And the Bible says, now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen, Traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word, watch this, to no one but their own community. This is still Acts chapter 11. After they were scattered because of the stoning of Stephen, now the Bible says that they're scattered abroad and their ministry is not full because they're still only preaching Jesus to their own community. Mm. Mm. Y'all getting this in? Mm -hmm. 
They're still only, they're still only preaching Jesus to their own community. Oh, y'all, y'all got to extend your borders here. They were comfortable with the Jewish community, and they only preached Jesus to the Jewish community. Yeah. But then the Bible says, watch this, then the Bible says in verse 20, but some of them were men from Cyprus. I thank God that he throws some strange folk in with us every now and then. Some of them were men from Cyprus, some were from Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists. Your other some translations may say the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now they're beginning to expand their reach. Yeah. They're beginning to, to spill over out of their own community. And the hand of the Lord, watch this, when they were preaching Jesus to anybody who would hear, when he's preaching Jesus to those who worship the gods of Greek mythology, when they're preaching Jesus to them, the Bible says the hand of the Lord was with them. They're not arguing over what method they're going to use. They're not arguing over what worship style. They're not arguing over what community they're going to reach. When they simply started sharing Jesus with anybody, the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. All it took were people that were willing to let the Lord use them according to his will wherever he chose to use them. Amen. That's it. Doesn't take a whole lot. Let me make sure you understand. Reaching souls and winning people to Jesus is not rocket science. Let me, let me, sh let me share with you how it works. Uh, you meet someone and you share with them what the Lord has done for you. And then you tell them, if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Come see the man. That's your whole script. That's it. That's the whole thing. You share with others what the Lord has accomplished, the work of Jesus Christ in your life. You begin to share with others what Jesus has done in your life, and then you share with them that if he can perform those things in my life, if he is able to perform it in me, he's able to perform it in you if you'll simply allow him to do it. And then after that, you tell them, come see the Savior that I shared all about. Now, now listen, now listen. The Bible says, then news of these things came to the ears of the church. In Jerusalem. And they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. They sent Barnabas to go see what's going on. Then the Bible says, and when he came and had seen, he doesn't see their works. Listen how, listen how the writer of Acts describes it. He says, when he saw the grace of God. He's not talking about how they were doing it. When he saw the grace of God at work. The Bible says he was glad and encouraged them all, all that with purpose of heart that they should continue for the Lord. And he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and the faith and a great many people were added to the Lord. And then Barnabas leaves to go get Saul from Tarsus. And the Bible says in verse 26 that they spent an entire year together with the church and taught a great many people. And they were first called Christians in Antioch. Listen, they're first called Christians not in Jerusalem. <laughs> I want to make sure you understand this. They're first called Christians, not in Jerusalem, not even Samaria, not Judea. They're first called <coughs> Christians in Antioch, sharing Jesus with foreigners. That's where they're first called Christians. I want to share with you four things and then I'm done. Write these down. I want to share with you four things. Four things about what it means for you to be a Christian. Because before we can talk about a method, before we can talk about how we're going to reach people for Jesus, the first thing that's necessary is for you to live the Christian life. It doesn't matter. We can come up with the most innovative plans and we can put lots of money into them, but unless the people are connected to Jesus, nothing works. You can give me limitless resources. And when I say limitless, I mean sky's the limit. You can give me limitless resources, but unless I'm connected with Jesus, it will profit nothing. 
So before we talk about method, let's talk about the people. Let's, before we talk about how we fulfill the mission, which is to create spiritual community, to evangelize the world, to edify the Lord. Before we fulfill the mission, let's talk about the people that are involved in the mission. Four things that, that you need to write down, that you need to apply to your lives. Number one, in order to uh, live out your calling, this is what it means for you to be a Christian. You have to receive Jesus Christ. What amazes me is that in many studies that are taken now, many of the studies that have been that, that, that have been produced about modern Christianity, not all Christians believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Can you believe that? Not all Christians. Remember, you're Christians. Christ is the first part of that word. That there are lots of people within Christendom that do not believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But in order for you to experience Christianity, you have to first receive Christ. In fact, if you don't believe me, and I know you do, but I want you to read with me first, uh, 2 Corinthians. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. This is what the Bible says about our Christianity. In, first, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The first step in living out your calling is receiving Jesus. The first step, and most of us, I, can, I, I think in this room, would say that I, I received Christ, right? To become a Christian means literally receiving Christ. It includes repenting and believing and forsaking our sins. Now, this is where we get in trouble. Because we can repent, we can believe, not all of us like to forsake our sins. Receiving Christ means, listen to me church family, receiving Christ means that it comes with a lifestyle of holy living. Amen. Christianity is not so cheap that you can live how you want to live and still tell people that I follow Jesus Christ. You can do what you want to do, say what you want to say, look like you want to play how you want to play. You can't do it. You can't do it. You cannot simply say that you're a Christian, but know that your lifestyle privately is contrary to your profession publicly. This, this is a hard word. I want you to get it. It's a hard word because it's going to cut. That's what that two-edged sword does. But God is calling us to a higher, a higher calling. There are higher principles here. That means that he's calling us to live as he lived. That means that, number one, if we are literally living as Christians, we must receive Christ, being, being made over in him. And 2 Corinthians is clear when it says, old things have passed away. So now I want you to take an inventory of your life and see whether or not the old things have truly passed away. I want you to think about it. Have I been made a new creature? Am I just studying and seeing stuff and getting excited about what I see, but still holding on to things that I know are outside the will of God? Don't talk to me about how woke you are, spiritually, if, if you know there are still things in your life that you're doing outside the will of God. Consciously do it. Still running with the wrong people, saying the wrong stuff, Drinking the wrong thing, smoking the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, whatever it is, and you know, well, he knows my heart. Yes, stop saying that. <laughs> he does know it, and the Bible says that he's trying to change it. Amen. He doesn't simply want to know it, he wants to change it. David said, created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. He didn't say, know my heart. He said, create in me a clean heart. Yeah. When he does refer to God knowing his heart, he's saying, God, you know who I am inside, and you need to change me. David literally says, create within me. The implication there is that there is something that has to be created because it doesn't, always, it, it doesn't naturally exist. He said, create within me a clean heart. So that means that there's some things i got to get right. There's some things I gotta, 
I got to let go by the wayside. Right? I got to let God have full control of my life. So number one, I have to receive Christ. <coughs> being made new. Receiving new life, new hope, new love, new joy, new peace. We are receiving Christ. That's number one. Number two about your Christianity is that you resemble Christ. Isn't that a mess? You're not just supposed to receive him. You're supposed to resemble him. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21. The Bible says, For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. 1 Peter tells us that he leaves us an example that we should follow in his steps. So number one, I'm not only to receive him. Number two, I am to resemble him. I've got to emulate Christ in my thinking and in my seeing and in my hearing and in my speaking and in my doing and in my going. The things that I do, I am to emulate Christ. Uh, I've shared this with you before when my children were, were, were babies and when they were learning to walk, Melvin uh, would see my shoes sitting next to the sofa. And he would put his, his little feet in my shoes. And he would start trying to walk with them. Now, they were too big, so he couldn't lift them up because his foot would come out of them. So what did he do? He just dragged them. <laughs> now, now, we laugh at that. But in his mind, he realized that every time I try to lift my foot out and walk like Daddy, I can't keep his shoes on. Best I can do is do what I can do with his shoes and walk in. He walked in my shoes. They didn't fit him. They were too big. They had more experience. Those shoes are probably older than he is. But he hasn't grown into them yet. Now listen, even though he hasn't grown into the shoe, he has learned to walk how he can in the shoe. He didn't fall. The shoe didn't come off. He knew that I'm not grown enough to walk all the way like that, but I can drag him and I'll keep those shoes on. That's Christian growth. That's emulating Christ. You have not grown all the way to the point where the person can slap you and you can turn the other cheek without balling on your fist. You're not there yet. You're not there when somebody can spit on you and you can say, Father, forgive them for they don't have to You're not there yet. So, you're, you're not there. But, but you haven't grown into them yet. That's why you're a part of spiritual community because you're supposed to be growing into it. But in the meantime, don't you take your, your feet out of his shoes. In the meantime, while you're trying to grow, you better drag his shoes with you. You better learn to walk as Jesus walked to the best of your ability while you are growing. And trust me, there will come a point where Melvin and Mark will be coming to me saying, Daddy, can I borrow your shoes? Because they will grow into them. And one day, they may grow past my size. You realize that at some point, parents may have to learn to walk like their children. Have you ever considered that for some of you, your parents are watching you because you're the witness to them? You outgrew their shoes, and now they're trying to drag their feet in yours. Realize that as children of the living God, you are to do more than simply take your feet out and say, well, this Christianity thing is too hard. I'm not mature enough for it yet. No, you better be a babe in your walk with Jesus. You better learn to walk with him as a little child. And even though your feet don't fit yet, you better drag those things because you have been made a new creature in him. That means you emulate Jesus. If there's an example, I'm trying to live up to it's Jesus. So number one, you receive him. Number two, you resemble him. As Christians, you got to work with diligence and purpose, setting your affection on things above. Look for the positive. Be kind, compassionate, understanding. 
I, I, I share this with, with couples in, in marital and premarital counseling all the time. When I'm dealing with, with couples sometimes in, in premarital counseling, I tell them one of the things that I discover about young couples uh, is that they have not learned basic people skills. We're not, talking, we're not talking rocket science here. I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm about to start my, my own marriage counseling ministry. What I'm saying is, if people would just learn basic people skills, 70% of the fights that they have would go away. If they would just learn how to talk to each other. Learn how to be kind. Learn that it's not all about you. Learn that marriage is less me and more we. That's what learning to emulate Jesus is. Emulating Jesus means that you are being kind and compassionate. You are living as he lived and responding as he responds. Can you do that? Lord. You can through the, indo the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. He has given you the power and you have to tap into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I pay my bills in my house. I do. Praise God. I pay bills. Can I get an amen for paying bills in this place? You better shout unto God with the voice of triumph and be thankful unto Him and be glad that you still got lights on in your house. There's still water flowing out your house. Listen, I pay bills in my house, and it does not matter how many bills I pay if I don't plug in. Y'all ain't getting this thing. Y'all ain't getting this thing. There is power flowing through my house. But it does me no good if I don't plug anything in. Right. I'm making the sacrifice without experiencing the benefit. Wow. There is power available if we would just tap in and we tap in through prayer. I want you to get this. We talked about it Wednesday night in prayer meeting. Prayer is the most powerful tool you have, and we do so little of it. So little prayer. Listen, if we would simply plug in, can you imagine what kind of power would pulse through you if early in the morning you started spending time with God? You started calling on his marvelous name, not just when you remembered him on Friday night. Trust me, I've been guilty before. I can go throughout the whole week, come down Friday night and realize, wait a minute, Lord. Because now on Friday, this is, this is, this is the handicap of, of, of Sabbath keeping. The challenge is on Friday night when you have learned to shut off the television and you're listening to soft music, meals prepared, we still believe in preparing for the Sabbath. Holiday. All of that stuff is done and then you sit down and you realize that the enemy is gone. And when I say the enemy, I'm talking about busyness. You're, you stop being busy on Friday night and then all of a sudden you remember that I didn't spend enough time with God. And the only reason you remember was because you took a moment and stopped being so busy. The greatest enemy of church and ministry and vision is busyness. When we're too busy to serve the Lord. Listen, number one, we, we have to receive him. Number two, we resemble him. Number three, let me make sure you get this. Number three, we have to represent him. Number one, you receive him. You, can't, you cannot be in a relationship with Christ unless you have him in your life. Number two, you resemble him. You begin to live out the example that he left. And then number three, you've got to represent him. Acts chapter 1, beginning of verse 8, or just verse 8 alone. These are the words of Christ himself. But you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me. In Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember I said number one, we're creating spiritual community. Creating spiritual community means you have received Christ and you are learning to grow, to emulate him in spiritual community. And then number two, we told you, number two, we told you that you evangelize the world. So that means that after you receive him and resemble him, then number three, you've got to represent him. Y'all still hear me? 
After you receive him and resemble him, you have to represent him. Now begins your work. Now begins your labor. Now begins your work of evangelizing the world. As Christians, we represent Christ at home, at school, work and play, everywhere. We have to seek to exemplify Jesus in deed and conversation. Missionaries are to represent Christ in foreign lands that speak and witness for him. We we have to do the same thing at home. That's the entire reason that we have mission doing. Because God impressed on my heart that we're always thinking about what happens uh, in places where we've never been when God planted you intentionally in the mission field of Durham, North Carolina. I want you to understand the mission room has less to do with, with your plan and your project and, and more to do with your location. You're in the mission field. Yeah. And there are needs that have to be met. Yeah. This begins the work of evangelizing the world. And evangelizing is more than simply preaching. Evangelizing is doing the good work of the gospel. Yeah. you got to represent Christ by giving words of encouragement. It's got to be represented in good deeds and witnessing to the unsaved about him. This is our task. Listen, listen, listen. We would spend less time talking about mission, mission and vision as a church if as children of God, individually, I took it upon myself to do the witness, the witnessing that God's called me to do. If every person in this sanctuary right now, young and old, if every person in this sanctuary started witnessing to others about Jesus, we wouldn't have to talk about mission and vision. We would be bursting at the seams. Right? Amen. We wouldn't be talking because most of the time we talk about what we do with vision and vision because we're trying to figure out what, what are we doing? Well, you don't have to figure out what you're doing when you're doing. And the mission is everybody has been called to share the gospel. We come here to worship. We come here to worship. We're not doing any work right now. I am. <laughs> but we're not doing any work right now. Right. This is where we come to celebrate the work that God has yes. done already. That's it. That's this it. is where we come to celebrate the work that God has done already. This is not evangelism right now. That's it. Even though every time I make an appeal and every time I prepare a sermon, I'm saying, God, I hope somebody is there to hear, hear the gospel and have their heart transformed. But the purpose of this experience is not to transform the world. We're not doing evangelism to the world in here. That's We're coming God. to recharge and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords That's in it. here. We're coming to celebrate what the Lord has done. But can you imagine if all of us have been activated by the Holy Spirit and when we go into the world, into the workplace, into our places of the world, into our places of influence, whether we're sitting with our crew, whether we're talking to our friends, whether we're walking in the grocery store, whether we're, whether we're dealing with our community, if, if all of us had tapped into the power. And before I left for work in the morning, I said, God, give me just one more. I don't know if you've ever seen Hacksaw Ridge, that story of Desmond Dawson, as, as he is taking one after the other, after the other to safety, this conscientious uh, objective, this Seventh-day Adventist man in the war is pulling them up one by one, saying, God, give me just one more. Give me just one more. Can that be your prayer every day? Lord, give me just one more. Listen, listen. You have to first receive him. You have to, number two, resemble him. You have to, number three, represent him. And then, number four, if you've been able to do those three, then we shall reign with him. Amen. That's it. Y'all, y'all excited about Amen. this the way that I am? After you have learned to, 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 to receive him and resemble him and represent him, then the Bible tells us that he that shall come will come. And he's going to receive us unto himself. That where he is, there we may be also. And we shall reign with him. That's what we're looking forward to. That's the reason that you're enduring this crazy, this crazy whirlwind of the world that we're in. That's why you're enduring all of the pain and the anguish. That's why when you're watching the politics and you're watching the wars and rumors of wars and you're watching 
Oh Lord, we thank you for reminding us today that we are Christians. And just being a Christian comes with a mission. That mission is to be a part of a spiritual community. That mission, God, is uh, to, to evangelize the world. That mission is to exalt your almighty name. And God, you have placed within us a testimony, a method of sharing the work of Jesus with the world around us. Lord, Help us not to be so organized that we organize ourselves out of productivity. Help us not to be so dependent on instruction from, from a ministry leader, so dependent on, on the organized ministry structure, because if I can't get into that structure, I won't do anything. God, we have structure for a reason. You've organized us for a purpose, but not so that we can simply sit by and let everybody else do the work. You called all of us into the body to do the work. And so, Lord, we're standing because you have somebody that you want each one of us to reach. Somebody in this city, somebody out of the city, you have called each one of us to share this gospel. God, help us. Help us to be faithful. Thank you for the calling that you placed on our lives to receive Jesus Christ, to resemble him in the world, to represent him in all that we do. And then, Lord, if we're able to do those, then we will reign with you forever. Help us to be faithful. Hands are still out, eyes are closed. There may be someone here. You came to church today, but you hear God calling your life. He's saying, I want you to learn to, to walk with me and talk with me. I want you to receive me today. If it's your desire to give your life to the Lord, you want to be baptized, you want special prayer, you may want to be baptism or Bible studies. Whatever it is, if your desire is to rededicate yourself and give your life to Christ today, I want you to raise your hand. You might have come from out of town and, and may not even be a member here, it doesn't matter. No matter how you grew up, if you feel God calling you right now, I want you to stick your hand up in the air and say, Lord, it's me. I want to give my life to you today. No matter how imperfect you are, no matter what flaws you are, you have. I don't care what you've done or where you came from. You can never go so far that the grace of God can't reach you. Where there's life, there's hope. Saying, Lord, I've made a lot of mistakes. I don't even know how to give up all this stuff yet. God is saying, greater is he that is in you. Yes. I'm not asking you to figure it out. I'm asking you to take the first step. If you take one step toward the Savior, he'll take the other ones to you. That's it. There can be a hundred steps between you and Jesus. He's only to asking you to take the first one. He'll make the other 99. Give your life to him today. This is between you and God. You want to give your life to him? Don't fight against it. Surrender to the Savior. I know you I know you might just be in church because you know this is the place to be, but not because you're trying to give your life to him, but you know he's calling you right now. You know he's calling you. I want you to raise that hand where you are. Accept him into your life right now, just between you and God. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, even as I pray. Even as I pray, you can lift that hand. Nobody's looking, just between you and God. Father, we surrender to you. We give our lives to you. We thank you for loving us with unquenchable love. We thank you for saving us with unimmeasurable grace. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. I pray for those that are in the valley of the decision that are wrestling right now, that God, you would transform them, touch them. I pray that they would have an encounter with the love of God that is so overwhelming for them this week that they would say, Lord, if you love me with that kind of love, I will walk with you the rest of my days. <laughs> and when you come, save us. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus, let all of God's redeemed declare together. Amen? Amen. Amen.